Hello everyone, welcome. This is Michael Conley, HP Granite and Health Promotion Live. Boy, it seems like it's been so long since we've had a webinar. Um, you know, last week being a holiday week, I've missed you guys horribly. Uh, but today we have Tracy McPherson and Bill McPeck, and they're going to talk about um, addressing substance abuse use and mental health in the workplace, uh, screening, brief interventions, and such. And let's see. Let me remind you that if you have questions, you can type them into the box, and we will pr probably save them till the end. Um, and anything else that I'm forgetting? See, you get out of practice, you, you lose your mind. I'm going to introduce Bill. So Bill McPeck is the Director of Employee Health and Safety at, uh, for Maine State Government. Bill oversees employee wellness, employee safety, and administers the state's Employee Assistance Program and Employee Drug, te t drug Testing Contracts. Uh, Bill is professionally trained as both a social worker and coach, and he is a Certified Worksite Wellness Program Consultant, Certified Work-Life Professional, and Certified Holistic Stress Management Trainer. Uh, Bill has over 30 years of experience in the public sector. His professional experience includes community mental health, public safety, employee benefits, employee health, wellness, employee safety. Bill coaches in the area of personal development management and supervision, uh, retirement preparation, worksite wellness, and individual organizational health and wellness. As the chairman of the main uh, council for worksite wellness, Bill works with organizations to help them develop and enhance their worksite wellness programs and to develop healthy organizational cultures. As a lifelong learner, Bill frequently states his knowledge, <laughs> shares his knowledge by delivering both in-person in -person and distance learning and education programs. Bill also serves as a mentor coach for the wellness team coach uh, of a consulting group, Wellness Strategies, based in Maine and New Hampshire. Bill. Please introduce um, Tracy, and I'm so glad you're here. Not to mention being a, Bill is also a really awesome, great friend of mine. So Bill, please take the floor. Great, Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is nice to be back with you because I've had to miss uh, several programs due to my presenting on Fridays during this time period. So it's nice that that program is over and I can reconnect. I'm really excited today to uh, bring to um, my mental yeah, my mental health colleagues, my worksite wellness and health promotion colleagues, uh, this program on screening and uh, brief intervention. Those of us who work in the workplace know that the um, issue of substance abuse and particular alcohol use can be a, a real issue that organizations have trouble uh, wrapping um, their hands around. And I think it's really uh, important for the worksite wellness community, worksite health promotion community to uh, look at additional ways that we can address this issue. And I think uh, screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment or the ESPERT model is a way for us to do that. And that's how I got uh, connected to uh, to Tracy uh, several years ago now through this um, project that was originally at uh, George Washington uh, University in Washington, D.C., and has just been recently moved to the University of uh, Chicago. Uh, I got invited to uh, work beginning in year two of the project to help uh, develop a model and to develop resources that can be uh, brought to the employer community. So I'm really excited today to bring Tracy to uh, you, my worksite uh, health promotion colleagues. Uh, Tracy is probably one of the, the leading researchers and presenters uh, in the country on this, uh, on the issue of health promotion and its relationship to uh, substance abuse uh, prevention. Uh, Tracy has her um, doctorate in an area that I should remember that I don't uh, at the moment and for the last five years has been specializing in the area of 
uh, substance uh, abuse and in particular alcohol use regarding um, the work site or at, at the work site. It's done some really exciting work which we're going to hear about today with the EAP programs. Uh, Tracy recently left uh, her and the um, senior uh, scientist, um, senior researcher, uh, Dr. Eric Gopalrud, uh recently left uh, George Washington University and are now at the University of Chicago, which is um, somehow connected into uh, the greater Washington area, which maybe Tracy can elaborate on a little bit uh, for us to give a little context, because one would think that the University of Chicago would be in Chicago. So, uh, Tracy, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And, and yes, I'm, uh, I've, I've recently moved our center, the Center for Integrated Behavioral Health Policy, which we had at GW for a number of years. We've recently moved uh, to NORC, which used to stand for the National Opinion Research Center. It's been around for about 70 years. But with a new rebranding, it's just now NORC. It uh, doesn't stand for anything. And we are uh, affiliated with the University of Chicago. But there is uh, the, the main campus, and downtown Chicago is where uh, we're headquartered. We have a Bethesda, Maryland office. Uh, primarily, uh, my department looks at uh, mental health, substance abuse, and criminal justice studies. And, and so if you're not familiar with us, I, I encourage you to, to take a look at our organization and learn a little bit more uh, about us. Um, let me just double check with you, Bill. Can you see the see the screen? Okay, is everything showing up all right? It is, Tracy. The the uh, opening uh, slide is up. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to to make sure everybody was seeing it and hearing me. Uh, okay. So and 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 even though I'm a I'm at a university and and or technically a professor, I'm really not an ivory tower academic by any means. I'm very much an applied uh, social uh, psychologist, health psychologist, working in uh, real world settings, applied settings, and I have been doing that for the last 13 years, specifically working with workplace uh, health promotion, wellness, occupational health and safety, and EAP uh, programs. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is looking at um, the impact of substance use and mental health in the workplace and how we might be able to apply an approach called screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, or what we often call SBI or SBIRT or SBIRT, and how you can take that model and use that kind of approach, the elements and the process of that approach and how you can use it with alcohol use, drug use, uh, depression. So even though we focus a lot on alcohol and we have some um, uh, sample protocols as resources for you that, that are written around alcohol, these can be adapted for other behavioral health issues So and as an evidence-based approach. So I wanted you to keep that, that in mind as well. And I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about the Big Initiative. I don't, uh, I don't know if anyone on this call is familiar with the Big Initiative, but uh, hopefully we'll uh, pique your curiosity to learn uh, more about Big. And uh, Big stands for the Brief Intervention Group Initiative. Okay. Let's see. Trying to get the the slide, there we go. Let's see if we can get the slide moving forward. Excellent. Okay. So the uh, the agenda for, for the webinar today is to give you a little bit of a context around the Workplace Expert Project. So why am I here talking about this anyway? And, and so I want to learn a little bit about what's been going on in the field and about the big initiative, give you some uh, evidence-based validated screening tools around alcohol, drug use, and depression talk to you about the brief intervention approaches that can be used to address substance abuse and mental health, and share with you some of the pilot study findings that we're doing working with uh, several employers and their behavioral health care provider, and offer you some resources. Uh, that's one of the, the great things about the big initiative, and what I do is I give away a lot of free 
public domain resources that aren't often disseminated very well. So to give you a little bit of context, um, the Workplace Expert Project started back in 2006, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, and SAMHSA, and the Network of Employers for Traffic Safety were really interested in, in, in understanding how we might adapt expert for non-medical settings, particularly the workplace. So how do we address worker uh, behavioral health issues uh, using validated approaches that have existed for many, many, uh, many years, over two decades, and give, translate those into real-world tools that health promotion and wellness practitioners and um, disease management, safety, and other practitioners can, can use. So those organizations came to uh, myself and Dr. Eric Doppler-Rude, who we both at the time were at GW, and, and said, help us to translate this. And then let's turn these into uh, toolkits and protocols and things that people can readily adapt uh, in their workplaces. And then let's go out and pilot test those. So we have a number of partners, Aetna, Optum, Value Options, and, and many employers, which um, I have a few listed on the slide later on, like J.P. Morgan Chase and Tyco and UPS and others who partnered with us to pilot test to see what the impact of adaptations of experts uh, would have in the workplace. So are we identifying people earlier? Are we getting them to a practitioner earlier to address risky alcohol use before there's an issue. So these are our, our partners. The overall aim, as I, I mentioned, is really to adapt what was came out of the medical field for these particular settings, EAP, Health, Health Promotion, Disease Management, and to expand alcohol expert approaches to include addressing drugs, tobacco, and depression. And tobacco and depression experts are uh, very much evidence-based and, and, and just as much um, historically um, the foundation of that research is very strong and can be applied in many different settings. Around drug experts, there are a lot of trials going on right now and they're very promising, but the, uh, the, all the evidence isn't completely, completely in. Uh, but we can say that we do think that based on our work and the federal government's work um, that uh, we do think we'll, this is something we'll be recommending strongly going forward. So part of that project was to really look at an extensive um, uh, body of literature in both the workplace and the medical arena and to find out, well, what is working well around experts and, and what isn't working well? And are there already adaptations in the workplace that we might be able to draw from, translate, for a broad variety of types of industry workplaces, and how can we disseminate that out? So we did this incredible literature review and really found out there, there wasn't much. I could count on one hand the number of workplace studies who had even looked at screening and brief intervention in the workplace. It was really overwhelmingly medical settings where, this, where, where the evidence was, in trauma centers, in hospitals, primary care, and, and so forth. And as you can imagine, you can't just take something out of the medical center and sort of pop it into the workplace setting and expect it to just, you know, integrate seamlessly. So realizing there wasn't a lot out there, we went uh, out to employers and to providers of workplace services, and we surveyed them twice. Uh, hundreds of people we surveyed, and then did some telephonic interviews to gain some real in-depth information about what tools they were using to screen, what kinds of brief intervention techniques were, were they using, and what kinds of referral processes were in place that seemed to be working well. And then we convened an advisory panel, which uh, Bill was part of back since, I think, what, 2007, and, and brought the experts, the stakeholders in employee, um, employer settings and uh, vendor provider settings clinicians, nurses, um, really a variety of stakeholders to really inform the process of what would screening and brief intervention look like in a workplace. And then we developed a conceptual model. So what I just described to you, we 
took two years to do. Uh, so that's just the process in a nutshell. But the conceptual model is very useful in, in sort of describing or picturing what it is that we uh, came up with. And this is, this is what we came up with as that feasible model. So what you're looking at on the left is what we learned is that workplaces were saying that self-referral was the primary way in which they anticipated their employees would um, encounter a professional, a workplace practitioner, um, to, to get some early screening or some uh, intervention around an alcohol use problem or a mental health issue. The other way was around automated processes in the workplace, such as web-based screening programs or telephonic um, telephone uh, lines or referral lines. Health risk assessments or health risk appraisals were another way that employers said they thought that uh, they could capture screening information and get people referred over to a practitioner. And also occupational health and safety um, uh, events like uh, the health fairs or safety fairs or uh, a physical exam, an annual physical exam by an OCK health staff person. So these were the ways we learned that were the most feasible and prob promising for getting people to a practitioner who could do some early intervention. What we, in the center you're seeing, is what we learned about who would be doing that uh, screening and brief intervention. The EAP was an obvious, at the very top, was the EAP, that health promotion and wellness programs can work with the EAP, an internal or external provider, to connect them to get the screening and brief intervention if someone is uh, showing that uh, they're, they're engaging in risky use. The occupational health and wellness staff, they employers and vendors thought that we can train these practitioners to do some uh, early brief screening and to provide some uh, guidance to an employee, giving them an appropriate referral on how to uh, get to a referral source, whether it's EAP or an external source, or perhaps even train the nurses on, on how to do some brief intervention right there in the workplace. So, we, that's what we learned about who would be doing um, expert in a workplace context. And then looking at the outcomes, what would we expect to achieve? What would be meaningful? Business relevant outcomes, also worker relevant outcomes. So we want to increase identification in our population of risky um, substance use or risk of mental health issues early. So the identification rate, are we, are we increasing it from, from what we're currently doing with our standard practice? And then what would it look like after we implemented an evidence-based practice? Do we improve worker productivity? Do we reduce the absenteeism and tardiness and other, other workplace um, uh, business-relevant outcomes? Do we uh, also increase referrals? Do we get people where they need to be more often? And do they actually uh, go to those uh, places? So from that point, we, we took what we learned and we developed protocols that could be seamlessly integrated into any of those workplace contexts that I mentioned earlier. And then we started with proof of concept studies to test that model that I just described to you. And we started with the EAP because predominantly health promotion and wellness and occupational health were referring people to the EAP. So that's where we started. And then um, from, from that, we just completed those at uh, uh, the end of 2010 and have got some preliminary data that I'll show you. We we're so encouraged by the findings that we launched a big initiative to disseminate information about the findings, to translate um, all these findings into, into real world practice, and to disseminate, disseminate the materials that we develop uh, out to workplaces and to practitioners or vendors of these kinds of, of expert services. 
and then to and then to also make available as much as possible free trainings and other um, uh, internet-based resources that that you can use. And I'll show you some of those in a little bit. So what, what is the big initiative? Well, the big initiative is that campaign that we're launching now to, to roll all of this information out, to educate the workplaces and educate the workplace vendors about SBIRT and what's available in terms of tools and materials and so forth. At this point, the Learning Collaborative um, is uh, of the big initiative. We have about 100 different organizations and that are participating actively, and we consider this representative of all of the supply chain of, of experts. And this is these are the uh, this is the supply chain or the members or the stakeholder groups um, of those hundred members are made up of the EAPs and MBHOs, employers, professional associations, clinicians, experts, research consultants pharmaceutical companies, and federal agency representatives. And here's just a, a very uh, short abbreviated list of some of those. Um, Maine State Government Bill, obviously, has very, uh, very, been very involved. But you can see there are lots of professional organizations and um, all sorts of different types of employers with uh, DOT regulated and safety sensitive, uh, white collar, blue collar, uh, lots of different industries. And that's what it's about, it's bringing people together to share information and their experiences. And we, I think we have probably at least a dozen um, or more running active pilot studies of effort in their uh, own workplaces with their um, provider, their, their vendors. So what does BIC do? I won't go into a lot of uh, uh, detail about this, but I, if you are interested in participating and getting a lot of this free information, we have a number of different um, kinds of groups and, uh, that you could get involved in. If you're interested in doing expert in your own organization, I'll, I would point you to the Systems and Operations Committee. If you're interested in getting your providers to do it or, or folks that you refer people to do, I might suggest the Clinical Improvement Committee. But you can go to our website, which is www.eapdig.org, and learn more about Big Initiative and sign up and download lots and lots of uh, free materials. And the other thing I, I mentioned to you is that if you're interested in, after this, getting more uh, training in this area, in the Washington, D.C. area on June 23rd, we have a free all-day workshop. And that will also offer free five free continuing education credits. And we will go through more in depth about SBIRT and how to conduct it, as well as how to use some motivational interviewing techniques to facilitate uh, having conversations with employees about uh, behavior change. So that's just one of the events coming, coming up. Uh, but uh, we have uh, others that you'll see listed on our website as well. So why should workplaces even care about substance use and mental health and even consider doing SBIRT? Well, what we're finding is that sustained heavy drinking, which, we, which is defined by uh, SAMHSA and, and NIDA as five or more drinks on one occasion, really increases the risk of health problems. So depression, sleep problems, hypertension, cancer, gastrointestinal, and so forth. If you, if you look at the evidence, you can connect sustained heavy drinking to almost any physical health condition. And what we're seeing is that the short-term risk of sustained heavy drinking are the safety problems. So we're, there's evidence of impaired judgment, reaction time, distraction, sleep disturbances, and so forth. So these are, are, are real problems that workplaces are, are very much concerned about. And whether it's from a health and productivity perspective or from a safety perspective, there's lots of reasons why we should be paying more attention to substance abuse and mental health. But I'm sure you're, uh, it wouldn't shock you to know that uh, oftentimes leadership or those in the C-suite are mostly interested in those that drive costs. So they're looking at hypertension, diabetes, and, and other kinds of conditions that uh, that seem to catch their eye around healthcare costs. What a lot of workplaces 
in the C-suite doesn't recognize is that the cause of alcohol problems, drug use problems, depression, don't always show up in terms of health care costs. So they're looking at their spreadsheets and their bar graphs, and it's not going to be at the top because there aren't often ways of capturing that information. Or practitioners are reluctant to code in medical charts um, alcohol use problems and so forth. So it's a lot less stigmatized to, to document diabetes or to have diagnostic codes and prescribe medications to capture that information around less stigmatized issues than it is around substance use. So we have to bring this kind of information back to our employers and get this on their radar screen. And one way to do this is to share with them this kind of information about the rationale behind uh, why we should even pay attention to alcohol and why we should um, think about using evidence-based approaches in the workplace to address risk. 80, it, it would surprise many employers to know that 80% of problem drinkers are employed. We often hear um, stereotypical things like, well, those are people that work for me. They're homeless, they're in prison, they're this or that. And that's really not the case. Most problem drinkers are employed. And 60% of alcohol-related absenteeism, tardiness, and poor work quality are caused by at-risk drinkers. So this is not those who necessarily meet diagnostic criteria. These are folks that are engaging in risky behavior that aren't going to show up necessarily as having an alcohol problem. Very difficult to measure these kinds of business metrics, but when you look at epidemiological data, this is, this is, these numbers and these statistics are driven from epidemiological studies. You also, su surprising to some, is that 20% of employees say that they've had to cover for a coworker required to work harder or were injured due to co-workers drinking. And I'm sure in any given workplace, if you surveyed your employee population and you asked them these questions, I'm sure 20% would not report that um, on a uh, employer-sponsored survey. Uh, these, th these kinds of um, anonymous, re anonymous responses that you get from epidemiological um, uh, large-scale surveys generate some very interesting data. And 20% of employees translates to millions and millions and millions of employees in, in many different industries that are having these kinds of experiences. So when we present this kind of information to employers, this does get their attention. So this is part of creating that value statement um, uh, uh, to your leadership. Um, and certainly you can feel free to use these slides. I'll make these available to help make that uh, business case of why we should be paying more attention to alcohol use and drug use and, and other behavioral health conditions. In, in, a, in addition, if you look at, the, at, at the, the research, substance use and mental health problems are associated with these kinds of things. These are the things, I'm sure there's something on here that keeps either you up at night or your leadership up at night. Maybe it's presenteeism. How present is someone at work when they're physically at work? Maybe it's lost work days. Maybe it's turnover. Some industries have incredibly high turnover rates. Healthcare utilization, workers' compensation, accidents, injuries, supervisory and coworker time that's diverted, workplace conflict and family disruptions. This is what we're seeing as the, the negative impact of substance and mental health problems. And, and these are the things that translate into um, a very high costs, whether it's economically or health costs. And these are the things, these are the kinds of um, val value statements that you can help uh, inform your leadership about why, again, you should be addressing these kinds of issues. Employers really often aren't aware that these things are connected. When you look at the prevalence of alcohol use, it's often surprising that, that people are unaware that alcohol use problems are almost as prevalent as diabetes. We're so uh, 
so much more aware of diabetes than and thinking about the prevalence in the workplace and the general population because it does show up on those bar graphs that leadership's looking at as costly um, health conditions that they need to attend to or have disease management programs in place for. But actually, alcohol problems are almost as prevalent. And we, but we do less to address those than we do diabetes. If you look at how many people actually get identified, less, less than 1% of the 8% who actually have a diagnosable disorder get identified. So this is a very, very, very small percentage that health plans are identifying of those who would meet diagnostic criteria. This does not include those who are engaging in risky use. So if we're only identifying a very fraction of those who have a diagnosable disorder, we are missing millions and millions and millions of people who don't meet criteria but are in our workplaces and engaging in risky use. And if you look at the the, the proportion of folks who actually get treatment, who need treatment, in the green, it's a very small proportion of people who actually get the treatment. And this doesn't actually imply that they get good treatment or the right treatment. We just know that they get some treatment. So we're missing lots of people, a lot of missed opportunities. When you look at the economic cost of alcohol problems, it's greater than high blood pressure, asthma, and diabetes combined. And as I mentioned earlier, those are the conditions that workplaces are more likely to attend to. And, and look at those dollar figures, yet alcohol really is more expensive. So and these numbers have not changed for years. And so that's what the big initiative is about. And that's what Esper's about, is let, you know, changing these statistics, moving, moving the needle in, in, in a direction, um, and the workplace can really play a huge role in, in, in changing these numbers and moving these, these um, outcomes. If you look at depression, it tends to be that it's less stigmatized than alcohol and drug use problems. We're getting better about talking about depression in the workplace, but still that's not in all industries. It's not across the board. And by 2020, it's expected to be the second most common disease in the world, affecting one in four women and one in 10 men and one out of six adults in their lifetime. Yet less than a quarter of those get adequate treatment. And it's often comorbid with alcohol use, drug use, and so forth. And depression is a common presenting problem. If you look at EAP cases, it's among the top three problems that people self-identify for. They don't always say, I think, you know, I'm depressed. They, they may present in a different way, but we're finding that it's much more common. It's just not necessarily identified in the workplace. It's getting picked up by your vendors and your providers. And many people aren't even aware, particularly older adults. They're, they're presenting for lots of other things going on in their life, but they're recognized more often by their family member or their spouse or by a practitioner who's doing some active listening with, a, with an older adult who's presented for some other issues. So screening tools are out there to help identify uh, a depression when people don't really know how to, they don't always express that it's what's going on in their life. So what we're finding is that having these tools helps the practitioner better identify really where someone is in a range of risk and determine whether it's alcohol use or is it depression or anxiety or, or, or so forth. With drug use, we're seeing that opioid pain medication misuse is a growing public health problem. 
and you may uh, listen to uh, a lot of what's coming out of the administration right now, doing active uh, outreach around educating um, a very broad group of people, not just the public, but focusing on workplaces and educating them about prescription drug misuse, because it really is a growing epidemic. And it's not a common preventing problem in any workplace settings. It's usually identified once a safety uh, incident has occurred uh, or there's some other mandatory referral incident. And by having screening tools, we can actually identify risky use before those accidents, injuries, and so forth happen. And there are tools specifically designed around opioid risk and other kinds of prescription medication uh, misuse. So workplace settings are uniquely positioned to identify substance use because people are spending most of their day in the workplace. That's where people spend most of their time. So we have EAPs and health promotion and wellness programs, brown bags, HRAs, health fairs, occupational health and safety, annual physical exams conducted by the nursing staff, disability and risk management programs. I'm thinking about an employer recently talked about uh, women who were out on uh, maternity leave and how they had 12 cases of postpartum depression. Their, through the disability de um, uh, department, they integrated routine screening for depression. And then disease management programs. So these are all of the opportune venues for identifying people using tools and then providing some brief ed education and intervention and getting them referral to the right kind of source. So the, the good news is that brief evidence-based approaches do exist for the, for the workplace practitioner to enhance existing practices and to integrate with the, the other things that you're already doing around these issues and to increase the value of the kinds of act, uh, services that you provide or the kinds of programming that, that you provide. And what we're trying to do with the big initiative is provide you with those materials and resources to do that case finding to identify those individuals early and intervene before there's an issue. So essentially making the right thing to do, the easy thing to do for the workplace practitioner. So who are we trying to identify? So we talked about the 8% of the population that would meet diagnostic criteria, and we're only identifying 1% or less. Well, the folks that I talked about that we're missing that are going completely under the radar screen, that's this group in the middle. This is the 25% of the general population who are engaging in risky, hazardous, or harmful use who exceed the daily risk guidelines. That's about 32.5 million people who could benefit just from screening, some brief education, some simple advice, and, and some, some other uh, kinds of um, strategies that I'll, I'll mention in a little bit. And it could perhaps even benefit just some, for a referral to all sorts of different kinds of programs. Not just AA, but it could be community-based programs or workshops that you have in, in your own setting or something that your, provender, your vendor provides. So those are the folks that Esbert is really designed to identify. So how do, we how do we identify them? We mentioned they don't show up unless there's usually there already at the high risk continuum. We really need to case find. And these are some of the ways the proven workplace interventions for alcohol-related problems. They've also been used for, for drug-related problems. You may have peer programs, peer referral programs, uh, interventions that are embedded into health and lifestyle. Uh, checks, psychosocial skills training like team awareness and team resilience programs, and then experts. So these are some of the kinds of evidence-based um, programs that you can consider. And the benefit of screening and brief intervention is that it can be done in all sorts of different um, modalities. You can do it phone and face-to-face. -face. Some folks are doing it through, um, through web-based interfaces and so forth. And these are the components of effort, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. 
And screening is really to identify that level of risk, the low, moderate, and high, and determine what level of intervention is appropriate for a level of risk. So we're not applying a hammer where we need a light touch and a light touch where we need, need more intensive intervention. So it really helps us to decide what's the appropriate level of intervention. And then for particularly for high risk, to determine where the most complex cases are and who really does need a referral, rather than just referring everyone. There are things that we can do in our own workplaces or through our vendors that can be effective without having to necessarily refer them out, which can be expensive. So this is just for, for your benefit of the terminology. The S screening for using a validated tool. BI is the brief intervention using an evidence-based framework. The RT is referral to treatment, and you put it all together, expert, and follow-up. And if you don't currently have a follow-up um, process in place, I would encourage you to ask your vendor uh, or your provider of services, right, behavioral health uh, services, what kind of follow-up they do. Because follow-up generally means better outcomes. And when you put follow-up with uh, screening and brief intervention, you have the opportunity to demonstrate the value of the services that you provide so that you can measure your identification rate at baseline and your identification rate at, at follow-up. So follow-up is um, something that we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, but it, it's something I would really encourage you to do. It's sort of a lost art in a lot of the behavioral health settings. They don't do a lot of follow-up anymore, but it, it is one really great predictor of, of better outcomes. And then the other terminology it is uh, MI, or the use of motivational interviewing strategies to help facilitate a conversation. So those are the kinds of terminology I'll use when I, I explain a little bit about the brief intervention component. So what is SBIRT? And I mentioned it was developed in the medical setting in trauma and ED. It's backed by scientific evidence of effectiveness. But only recently has it really been adapted for the workplace and other behavioral health settings. The goal or the aim of SBIRT is to increase early identification of workers with risky alcohol problems, build awareness and educate workers on the guidelines recommended by uh, the federal agencies, the US guidelines, and the risks associated with alcohol use, motivate at risk workers to reduce their unhealthy, risky, or, or hazardous alcohol use, and to adopt health-promoting practices, and motivate them to seek help. If you're interested in the evidence behind SBIRT, there are volumes that are dedicated to it, and there are links provided for you there. And your tax dollars at work, um, there, I will mention uh, one study of effectiveness. The federal government has SBIRT demonstration projects all over the United States. And what they're finding is that when you do screening and brief intervention routinely, you can improve, you can, you can improve alcohol use risk and use of illegal drug use significantly, reducing nearly 50% um, of those who actually receive brief intervention change their patterns of use. So we're showing some really promising findings that are coming out of the effort demonstration project. And if you're, if you're in Colorado or you're in um, Florida, there are some other um, effort sites across the country. They're good resources in your geographical location for getting training. And I would encourage you to see if you have an expert site in your state that you can tap into some of their resources. So here are the screening tools that we recommend um, that you can integrate and we pilot tested in the workplace. For alcohol, there's a single item developed by NIAAA. Simply how many times in the past year have you had X or more drinks in a day, and the guidelines are five or more for men and four or more for women, and this would be considered a, this would be considered risky alcohol use, and this would be a, a, a person who would be a perfect candidate for a brief intervention, education, and building awareness. 
When you're asking about alcohol use, one of the tools that you might want to consider using is a standard drink chart. So you can explain to individuals what you mean by a standard drink. When you're asking about the quantity and frequency of alcohol use, some people aren't aware that one beer or a 12-ounce can or a 5-ounce table, glass of table wine is actually a standard drink. So you may have to explain that to them in order for them to accurately quantify how much, how much alcohol they're consuming. So you can use this in face-to-face, -face, or you can simply describe it if you're providing some telephonic services. This is the audit tool developed by the World Health Organization that detects alcohol use problems in the last year. And I have sent uh, copies of that as handouts so that you can refer to uh, later. But the first three items are called the audit C. And they can be used alone as their own tool to screen for risky alcohol use. And based on how someone scores, then you would administer the remaining seven items if they score above a threshold. So you're not burdening people with more questions than we need to be asking them. Very quick and easy to administer, uh, less than, than two minutes. Here are the three questions, the audit C questions. The C questions, um, so the C stands for consumption, so quantity and frequency. How often do you have a drink? How many drinks containing alcohol do you have in a typical day? And how often do you have five or more? So each response corresponds to point zero to four. You simply present the, the items, they present their response, you're, you're able to um, determine which response equals which number of points. You add that up. And the score of four or more for men and three or more for women and those over 65 would be positive. That person would be eligible or be appropriate for brief intervention. And then you could also um, then follow with the remaining seven questions of the audit. And this is how you would score the, the audit. So someone from zero to seven would be low risk, and they would just get alcohol education. Someone with eight to 19 would get some moderate level of brief intervention, some feedback around the norm around the general population, some simple advice around uh, behavior change. And then level three would be high risk. So they would get all of that plus a referral to treatment or some sort of um, counseling resource. There's a one item drug use item that can also be used as a screening tool. So how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? An answer of one or more is considered a positive screen. And that person would be appropriate to receive some level of brief intervention. The two item depression screener can also easily be integrated into your HRA or your clinical intake process or your, your annual physical. And the two items come from the PHQ2. So over the past two weeks, have you been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? So yes answer would require further evaluation. So you could then refer someone to the EAP or to a counselor or some other resource to get some further assessment. And I provided you links with the full PHQ-9 tool. And this is a copy of the PHQ-9 tool. So in this case, like the audit, if someone did score um, endorsing yes, any of them, you could give the full, the full uh, PHQ to be able to better assess in more depth their level of risk for depression. And here is how you would score it. So there's a nice way of understanding or interpreting the severity of the risk for depression and then to better understand what the treatment recommendations would be. So again, applying the right level of touch, the light, the more intensive touch to the right level of brief intervention as determined by the score. 
on the PHQ. So when people score positive on these, they have the opportunity to rise to brief intervention. And if you're a person who uses motivational interviewing or kind of behavioral approaches, you can integrate some of these strategies. Or if you're interested in learning more um, about motivational interviewing, there are lots of different um, webinars and workshops available to help you do that. And you, know, you don't have to be an expert in motivational interviewing to do brief intervention, but some key strategies are very, very helpful. But the, the motivational interviewing is, is, and the expert are very similar in that they're very non-confrontational and they're sort of they're client centered. They're meeting people where they are in their stage of change. And the expert process is really to help uh, identify whether there's a real or potential problem, alcohol use, uh, drug use, or a risk for depression, and really to motivate them to do something about it. And as I mentioned, it's effective with other other health conditions. So it's not a quick fix treatment. And it's important to remember that when people score high risk on these screening tools, that we're getting them the specialist care that they need and not just relying on brief intervention when someone really is at risk. And these are the elements of the brief intervention using the MI strategy. So you would provide some screening for feedback based on uh, the, the interpretation, the score interpretation. Um, uh, tables that I gave you just a minute ago. You provide some education around the risks and guidelines. So educating people on what is safe guidelines. So for men, no more than two per day, uh, seven per week, or no more than four on any occasion, or 14, I'm sorry, two per day, 14 per week, or no more than four on any occasion. And for men, it's one, and for women, it's one per day, seven per week, and no more than three on any occasion. So you give them that education around the state guidelines. Then you could give them some normative feedback about how they compare to other people. So in general, people, um, about 72% of the population, never exceed those guidelines. So that's giving them some normative information. You would tell them that most people never exceed those, those guidelines. So they're in a very small proportion of the population who do to give them a sense of how they really compare to other people. Then you could provide some simple advice. And in this context, simple advice is recommending that they cut back. They drink less. They don't get behind the wheel of a vehicle. They don't um, come to work um, hungover. I mean, lots of different ways of giving them simple advice. But you're, you're giving them some guidance. And then using some motivational strategies, asking them to tell you about how important it is for them to cut back or how confident they are that they could cut back. Do they feel, feel um, efficacious in cutting back? And then assisting with an action plan to move forward, setting goals, giving them some encouragement, providing some resources, and then providing referrals. I'm sorry, I've been I've been sick for the last week, so I apologize. I'm losing my voice here. So here are some resources for you to uh, you can use this as an educational brochure. This is the companion website. <laughs> And this is where you can download many copies of the Rethinking Drinking for your employee population. And I've sent um, some samples of some um, expert protocols that you can use in your own organization. And this is just a description of those. So that's a handout that you can use and decide which kind of uh, protocol you want to use. And this is what they look like. So when you look at the handouts, you'll know what you're looking for. Tracy, uh -huh. <laughs> why don't you, uh, given the time, why don't you uh, just very quickly uh, cover the the significant <laughs> results 
from the, the pilot tests and how drastically they're different from what we've traditionally seen, and then leave a few minutes for questions. Okay, that sounds good. So this is just for your, your reference uh, later on. It's a concept model of the pilot program that, that we use. It's similar to what I showed you before in the conceptual model. This, this just is a, a snapshot of the elements of the intervention that we use in our pilot study. So all the elements that I described a minute ago based on the low, moderate, and high score. And then we use our pilot test site. We use an employer in the financial services industry at a pretty sizable uh, population. And these were all self-referral non-emergency cases. And they had a dedicated team of EAT counselors who did the screening and the brief intervention. And then we compared the baseline results to the post the post expert implementation at five months. So at five months, at baseline, if you compare the two, we went from a less than 1% identification rate of risky alcohol use to an 18.5% rate identification rate using the audit screening tool. And if we had just relied on presenting problems where they say that they think they might have an alcohol use problem, our identification rate would have been 6%. So you can see there's drastic differences when you're using different kinds of, of measurements. So service as usual versus uh, they did some education and, and they had more people presenting for uh, alcohol use problems. And then they implemented the tool. So you can see the sizable increase in the identification rate. And then when they asked them about following up, um, could we follow up with them? Most about, about uh, three quarters of the employees said, "Yes, please follow up with me. I would like to see. I'd like to talk to you in 30, 60, 90 days about what's what's going on." And they were very appreciative of the information they had gotten about their alcohol use, and said that they'd be glad to have a follow-up conversation about it. So it kind of debunks the myth that people won't talk about alcohol use and wouldn't agree to talk a second time about their risky use, but that's not what we found. And then we found that about three quarters set an appointment for some sort of face-to-face -face counseling, and these folks were encouraged to talk to the counselor <coughs> uh, about, um, about whatever presenting problem they had. It might have been depression. It could have been um, something going on at work. But they were encouraged to have a conversation about alcohol use, too, and the connection between them. And then we replicated the findings, which was, um, you, you never know. It, it's just very encouraging in one pilot test, and you're not going to see this in another site. But we actually did in a very um, ex, you know, a separate pilot site that had nothing to do with the Aetna study. We replicated it. We went from a 7.5 identification rate to a 20% identification rate for hazardous risky use. And for those in the dependence category, went from a 7.1 to a 10% identification rate. So I'll just leave you with this, is that, this, that there are many suitable methods for intervening. And, and the Institute of Medicine recommended ESPERT over 20 years ago. And it, it, it's just now that we're really translating it uh, into practice. As you can see with the pilot studies, there's lots of promising, um, promising results in the, work, in the workplace. So I would encourage you to Think about how you can integrate it into your own organization. We make it easy, the right thing to do, the easy thing to do. And then there's this alternative approach, which is this is actually a real case where someone uh, tried to eat their underwear to be able to beat their, um, their screening test results. And then I can open it uh, up for questions. Um, this, is, this is just a snapshot of the, some of the handouts that you have from, from here on out. The rest of the slide deck is stuff that's been sent uh, to folks. Wonderful, so, Tracy. You, okay. <laughs> that, that was a great. And that, was, that was great, and that was tons of uh, really good information. Uh, let's see, like a couple of questions. One, uh, will the slides be available? Can you uh, provide me with a... Um, slide deck that I can make available for people? Yes. Okay, super. Yeah, if you can just email that to me, we'll 
we can get that up on the website uh, at the same place where this archive will be housed. Uh, let's okay. see. Then Larry wants to know, uh, is it possible for a worksite, um, for a wellness coordinator in a company to be involved in brief interventions, uh, or is a nurse necessary? Oh, no, of course, absolutely. Um, it, it can be done by all sorts of different types of workplace practitioners. Health promotion, I, I did health promotion um, work integrating substance use and mental health into a broad health promotion um, initiatives and very much can be integrated. It does better when it's integrated into those programs and, and, the, and the health promotion practitioners were the ones who did administer those programs. Great. Let me also add, Michael, that, 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 that this is one of the challenges that we've uh, identified in the uh, ESPERT uh, process and the big initiative in that how to incorporate the process into the wellness, uh, or under the wellness umbrella. And I think one of the biggest issues that we have to yet to address is, is the issue of confidentiality and, and how we can absolutely protect the confidentiality of the uh, individual taking the uh, screening and then and receiving the follow-up uh, brief intervention. So uh, I would encourage my colleagues to think about that. And Bill, I can follow up on that. One, one, um, one way that we, we've done this in working with multiple units within a, an organization is that the health promotion practitioners will use the screening tools and they provide some education, provide the risky drinking um, uh, education information that I shared with you, provide the rethinking drinking brochure and the website, and, and have an educational conversation, and then refer them if they want to have a more in-depth conversation to the EAP or their a service provider who has some of those confidentiality uh, uh, concerns at the forefront and have lots of mechanisms in place. Um, you know, so that's a really one particularly effective way of doing it. And also the screening tool gets away at diagnoses. It, it really is about screening for risk. So that's also very helpful in, in when you're concerned about liability issues or legal issues and privacy issues. It doesn't lead to a diagnosis. Mm. Uh, let's see, two, two more questions. Actually, the questions are uh, really going crazy now. <laughs> uh, let's see, Jenny said uh, she thinks uh, employees will not answer honestly for fear of repercussions. How do you solve that? Well, I, I will, you know, that is a, a common perception uh, um, uh, among many workplace practitioners in all sorts of types of departments. Uh, and, and EAPs and, and disease management and I'm really all over. But to be honest with you, um, that's not what we find. What we find is that employees don't know the difference. They think that practitioners are supposed to be asking these questions. We have a 97% participation rate where they complete the screening. In some mm -hmm. sites it's been 93%. Very high levels of participation. And our, when you look at the rates of identification, when you get up around 18, 20, 23%, that's a lot of people being really honest. Mm. So we're identifying a lot of people. So we, we really have not found that. Interesting. Um, yeah. Shelly wants to know, uh, have you looked at the three-session teen intervene model, motivational interviewing, and adapting that to the brief intervention model for adults? For the, for the teen? I think she's saying, have you looked at the teen, the teen intervene model and, and uh, motivational interviewing and adapting it to the brief intervention model for adults? Oh, yes, that's uh, in, in, in our in, more in-depth trainings where we uh, and I have some webinars and your resources hand out. There's some free free webinars. We do. Okay. We integrate. We integrate. We take the best of expert and motive and then the, you know, the MI strategies that are quite core. And that's what's really unique about this is it's a it's a it's a fusion. We we, we put them together because an expert you give advice and 
MI, you don't give advice. But what we do is we bring the best of the two worlds together, and, and, and that's what it does. This protocol that I mentioned to you, uh, you'll, you'll see, if you take a look at those, how it's woven together. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to sit into it on another, uh, you know, more in-depth training to get to see how that works. Super. Okay. Um, let's see. The other thing, um, I guess just an observation, um, Claire said, as a therapist, our PARQ health screening should include amount of alcohol consumption because athletes shrug it off. Let's see. Shelley wants to know how can I get access to the adult model. I assume that's is that included in all your handouts. Did, what, did you say a, a, the audit or the adult? Did you say the, adult or audit? The adult model that you that the brief intervention model you're referencing. Yes, yeah, so the the brief intervention um, the brief intervention model is uh, is in the is in the built into the the protocol all of the elements are fleshed out in detail of that model right okay well in that there's a couple more questions but darn it we ran over but uh, it's not because we were sitting around uh, you know chit chatting that was really great yeah. um, <laughs> really appreciate uh, you uh, sharing that information with us um, and I'm, I'm glad to, and I appreciate people bearing with me as I've uh, just been uh, just recovering from from being sick for a week. So uh, thanks for your thank you for your your patience and me getting through it without going into a complete coughing fit. <laughs> well, glad you're feeling better. And Bill, thanks for being here um, and your contributions. And Kelly just sent me a note saying that the handouts are all now available on the website, and this has been recorded. Uh, so it'll be available later this afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, you guys. Um, have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.